to introduce to you, most everybody knows Speaker John Deal, who got right to work passed in that house. I'm thrilled to tell you that. John. Thanks. spring day, very rarely this time of year do we get to see the outside. It's kind of always, uh, we're here a lot of times before the sun comes up and we uh, don't leave until the sun goes down. So thanks for making the trip up here today. And this issue of worker freedom is a very important reason to take times out of your busy day to come up here. Uh, I'm proud that earlier in this session, my colleagues and I in the House uh, took historic action to approve right to work legislation for the first time in the history of the state. Sure, workers have the option to join or not join a union, uh, but the impact it would have on our state is enormous and wide reaching. This is an issue of defending one of fundamental principles of liberty our nation was founded upon by giving workers true freedom to decide. And beyond that, right to work will open doors of economic opportunity for the state, whether it's, a, whether it's in the dramatic shift of population to right to work states, or the huge increases in job growth it will bring or higher rate of wage increases, the numbers are clear. Right to work is the way to spur economic growth and job creation across the nation and here in Missouri. It's an undeniable truth that even our own governor's administration cannot deny. The time is now to make Missouri the nation's 26th right to work state. <laughs> Chairman Bill Lant and Holly Rader, who've been instrumental in helping uh, bring this issue forward on uh, the session, as well as uh, many other members and advocates for this important issue, are here to talk today. I'm not going to take up all the time. I want you to hear from these from these other people who have been working on this issue for a long time, uh, very diligently and, and very passionately. So thank you for coming out here today. Hopefully, we'll see some action on that this, on this issue this year. So thank you. Very much. You all know, for anyone who's uh, dealt with her in this, she, she's relentless in a good way. Certainly very passionate and sincere about the issue. So, Mary, thank you for, for bringing that. That speaker has been a champion for right to work ever since I've known him, and that's Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder. We're going to bring him up. He has a few words. So, thank you, Governor Kinder. supporters of freedom to work. And this is the year we're going to get it done. Yeah. Yeah. I want to salute the extraordinarily able leadership that we've had in the House. <laughs> Speaker Deal proved as majority floor leader that he could actually deliver results for us. He led the override last year of Governor Nixon's income tax cut veto. And 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 he had, you know how many votes he had on third reading on that? They said he was so far short of 109, he'd never make it to 109. He had 93 votes on third read of the income tax bill. And in September, he found the other 16 and overrode Jay Nixon on the income tax bill. Because that's exactly the historic vote we had on third read and final passage of right to work yeah. this year. Uh, I believe February 13th or 14th, it was before the middle of February that this bill went to the Senate. I'd say more, I'd say more than three months is long enough for it to be in the Senate. It's time for the Senate to act. Two and a half to three years speaking on this topic to anyone who would put up with me. 
and there's overwhelming support out state, but there's growing support in the two cities, in the metropolitan areas. You know, we, many of you come from distant small towns and rural parts of the state, but we cannot have a healthy Missouri economy if we don't have a healthy metropolitan St. Louis economy. It's 40% of our state's population and 50% of our state's economic activity, and St. Louis is in trouble. The Governor Nixon wants to cite the, the recent success, the increased investments by GM at Winsville, and that's fine. We all celebrate that, and we work together to bring that about, and these lawmakers did. But not that many years ago, St. Louis had five auto plants. And less than seven years ago, St. Louis had four auto plants, assembly plants, and now we have one. And we're supposed to be thrilled to death. How many of you know young people who are graduating, finishing their education, and going off to Tennessee or Texas or Florida or to the Southwest uh, for new opportunities that we used to have in Missouri? I am tired of that, personally. I want to see our talented, the promising young people stay here in Missouri. And freedom to work is the way to bring that about. <laughs> All credit to these House members who took the vote early in this session to Speaker Deal and Majority Floor Leader Todd Richardson who got the bill over to the Senate. Now it's up to our Republican Majority Senate, 25 to 9. I would have killed for that many senators when I was Senate Leader. <laughs> I had 18 to 16 my first two years, 01 to 03, and then I had 20 to 14. Now we're 25 to 9. They need to bring the bill out next week, get it to the floor, get it to a vote, and put it on Governor Nixon's desk. And I believe you all will have made that happen. Citizens for Rights Work, Iowans for Rights Work, and the Illinois Right to Work Committee. Um, so I'm kind of show you some of the experiences there, how it can apply to, to here in Missouri, or Missouri. Which does this one prefer? <laughs> uh, uh, I'll never get it right. <laughs> right to Work for Less, a union busting bill. And of course, as billboards across the state have said, uh, Communist China, a right to work state since 1921. These arguments are not unique to Missouri's fight to pass right to work. As I fought to pass right to work in Wisconsin, and not that anyone's counting, but we did pass right to work in Wisconsin about a month ago. states are now free from the shackles of compulsory unionism. We're halfway there, but again, who's counting, right? As executive director of the Wisconsin Citizens for Right to Work, I fought to make Wisconsin America's 25th right to work states, and I heard those same arguments over and over. You and I both know those are blatant lies. So why does the other side use them? Because we have the right on our side, and all they have left is fear mongering. Right to work for less, not so much. Studies show workers in right to work states actually enjoy anywhere from $2,800 to $3,400 more per year in actual purchasing power than families in forced unionism states, like here in Missouri. In fact, according to the Department of Labor's own statistics, real market sector employee compensation is a depressing 3.8% here in Missouri. And you know what it is in Midwestern right to work states? 17.5%. Right to work is nothing more than a union busting bill. Again, not so much. If that's the case, then why is there more than 50,000 new union jobs in Indiana since the passage of right to work? Now you may ask, how is it that workers can choose to leave a union, but yet more union jobs are created? And that's a fair question with a very simple answer. Because Indiana's experienced a boom in job creation, partly thanks to the right to work in both union and non-union jobs. In fact, Indiana currently ranks number one in the country in manufacturing job growth. 
And those are jobs that you could use here in Missouri. Now, my favorite one, Communist China, a right to work state since 1921. Well, where do I begin with that one? Well, of course, I could point out that China has the largest union in the world. Right. <laughs> but I'd rather focus on freedom. Because at the heart of it, freedom is what right to work is all about. Freedom of association, by extension, freedom of speech, or as I like to call it, your First Amendment right. People shouldn't be forced into a private group in order to earn a living for their families. That's just plain un-American. Only big labor has that sweetheart deal. If I owned a business and you were my employee, could I come to you and tell you that if you want to get your paycheck every two weeks, you have to join the Rotary Club? No, of course not. That would be, you know, be silly, and nor should I be able to. But yet that's exactly how forced unionism states steal your freedom today, just like communist China steals the freedom of its people. I have to say, though, I really do like Missouri. I ac uh, accidentally applied for a job with Claire McCaskill when I first got into politics. I thought I was applying for a Todd Aiken job. <laughs> uh, they, loved, they wanted to get me because I was in the news media for a decade, so they thought I was a liberal. I'm not. <laughs> uh, also, while traveling through Missouri, I actually uh, was in a hotel, and my car was broken into and had everything I owned was stolen. Turned out that that was in Ferguson before Ferguson became a household name. So I had an experience there myself. Uh, but the barbecue here is great, and I really do love the show me steak. But I fear it could be being left behind. Because in the last three years, we have three new right to work states Indiana, Michigan, and of course, most recently, Wisconsin. Kentucky State Senate has passed right to work. In Illinois, your neighbors, it's a hotly debated issue there. And one co county in southern Illinois has already voted for, to put right to work on the ballot. Now, I'm not saying the county way to go is the best way to go, but the fight is waging on, even in a state like Illinois. And I know the fight is on here as well, thanks to the hard work of some of the people in this room and throughout the state. A version of right to work has passed the House, as we just heard about, and hopefully we can get a clean bill through the Senate and to the governor's desk. So we are gaining ground here. But could Illinois, home of the Chicago-style union corrupt politics, actually beat Missouri in passing right to work first? As executive director of the Illinois Right to Work Committee, I'm actually working to make sure that happens. But I think most people would agree, logic dictates it should pass here in Missouri first. But it's not going to be easy. It's never easy taking money and power out of the hands of big labor and their political allies and putting it back into the hands of the workers they claim to represent. It won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Now, I'm sure you all heard about the fight in Wisconsin back in 2010, the fight that propelled Governor Scott Walker into the national limelight over his Act 10 proposal. Well, what I found as I traveled the state from Green Bay to Milwaukee and everywhere in between while trying to mobilize a grassroots army to apply pressure to politicians to pass right to work was a lot of people thought Wisconsin was already a right to work state. They thought Act 10 made Wisconsin a right to work state, but it didn't. Act 10 didn't touch the private sector and there were still more than 180,000 Wisconsin workers who had no choice but to pay union dues if they wanted to feed their families. Now, you may, you may remember from the lies of new co news coverage from Madison how ugly the Act 10 uh, fight was. Protesters vandalizing the beautiful state capitol, an angry mob being bussed in from out of state, an illegal strike, property damage, death threats, and of course, union-labeled House Democrats fleeing to Illinois for a vacation when they were supposed to be on the job representing the people. The memories of Act 10 made, uh, battle made politicians anxious about a vote on right to work. In fact, Scared is probably the better word. They uh, were worried about labor unrest. Ooh. They didn't want a repeat of Act 10. In fact, it frightened Governor Walker so much, he was publicly saying that right to work was a distraction. So with all that working against us, how did we get the job done in big labor's home state? Well, we had two big advantages. First, public opinion. Polls showed somewhere between 68 and 77 percent of all Wisconsin households supported right to work including a slim majority of Democrats and a or a slim majority of union households and a plurality of Democrats. And more importantly, we have right on our side. That's the advantage when you're fighting for freedom. We were able to combine public opinion and being right to rally public opposition to compulsory unionism. Then we channeled that grassroots pressure to the politicians as right to work supporters throughout America's dairy land made it clear. They wanted to open Wisconsin up for business and free the workers of the Badger State by becoming the next right to work state. And you know what happened once the grassroots made their voice heard? The leadership in both the State Senate and State Assembly actually listened. 
They made right to work priority number one. And the governor even changed his tune. Gone was the language of right to work being a distraction. Replaced with, you may remember, a CPAC victory lap bragging about his intentions to sign the bill into law as soon as it reached his desk. And to his credit, he did just that. Now again, it wasn't easy. Big Labor tried to take over committee hearings. You know, be aware of those guys. Big Labor tried to take over committee hearings. <coughs> many protesters getting kicked out of the hearings. I and other right to work proponents were heckled and booed. But right to work supporters stood strong. The union bosses then shifted gears and tried to fight for carve-outs for construction unions because they're so much different. But right to work supporters again stood their ground. Big laborers and the, in the, uh, in their allies in the assembly made one last ditch effort to force an amendment to the bill that would delay the implementation for <coughs> months, allowing big labor lawyers to force long-term contracts that would bind the workers in a particular shop into unionism for years to come. But once again, right to work supporters would not compromise because there is no compromise when it comes to freeing American workers. Amen. And the result, well, maybe I should have issued a spoiler alert at the beginning of the speech, but the Wisconsin right to work bills passed, uh, failed through the Senate first with only one Republican voting against it. The next week, the House, so you didn't have to wait months like you guys are. The next week, the House overwhelmingly passed the Senate bill this time with no, not, without a single Republican <coughs> voting day. And then on the following business day, Governor Walker made history signing the bill into law. And while it's far too early to get any statistics on the impact of right to work has had on job growth in Wisconsin, if Indiana and Michigan are any indication, Wisconsin has something great to look forward to. Lots of help wanted signs as companies across America get the message loud and clear that Wisconsin <coughs> is open for business. And Missouri should be open for their business too. Now I could stand here and recite recite statistics to you all day, but you'll hear enough stats and numbers when you watch the NFL draft tomorrow and see who the, the Rams and Chiefs select. So I won't bore you with a bunch of statistics like, you know, for example, according to the Bureau of Commerce, Missouri has nearly twice the number of wealth, uh, welfare rate compared to Midwestern right to work states. I'm sorry, I had to get one in. Because at the end of the day, even if right to work was a net net neutral on the economy, it's not, but even if it was, it will still be the right thing to do for the people of Missouri just as it was the right thing to do for the people of Wisconsin, and just like it's the right thing to do for all Americans. Because as I can't stress enough, right to work is about freedom. This isn't a fight about if unions are good or bad. Remember what President Obama told the PolitiFact lie of the year when he said over and over again, if you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan? Well, the beautiful thing about right to work is, if you like your union, you actually can keep your union. But for those who don't, under right to work, they finally had their First Amendment rights reestablished. They finally had the freedom to choose. I want to thank everybody here for not only indulging me and listening me ramble on, but for all the work you do. It takes fighters to win a battle, and I'm encouraged to see there's no shortage of fighters here in Missouri. Let your voice be heard. Pressure the politicians to stand up for freedom and against coercion. And I don't want to be too tough on the politicians because I know we have some in this room who are fighting hard for freedom today. But we need more. And it's the activist's job, it's your job, to prove to the politicians that they'll actually be rewarded at the ballot box if they take the side of freedom and not the side of the union boss elite. It's only with your efforts that Missouri can follow Wisconsin and become America's 26th right to work state. And with that, are you doing a question? No. No, no time for questions, sorry. So with that, I just thank you for your time and keep up the great work. <laughs> Pretty great, right? Yeah. yeah. But 
That's not how it works, and everyone in this room knows that's not how it works. In the private sector, you're hired to do a job, and they expect you to do it. But the opponents of right to work enjoy that exact arrangement. In the public sector, government union workers are allowed to leave their job during work time to lobby government officials to vote no on right to work. And all of you are paying for that. And it's called a little known subsidy, union release time, where government workers all over the state, at the state government level, the local level, and in school districts, are paid to do just union business. And that's Wrong. ridiculous. Wrong. There's no reason why Missouri tax dollars should support special interest groups that only support themselves. And they get these special privileges through collective bargaining negotiations, where all of your public employers and elected officials negotiate these contracts to give this perk to unions, where they can negotiate contracts, represent employees and grievances, lobby politicians against right to work, and all sorts of other activities that union dues should be paying for. And so, my organization, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, has set out on the task to expose this wasteful subsidy to government unions. And we started off in Missouri. And unfortunately, we found out in Missouri, they don't really keep track of union release time. And what we found is most school districts, state agencies, and cities and local agencies didn't know how, much, how many hours and how much it costs to allow their government workers to do other activity other than the ones they were hired to do. For instance, in the Grandville school, Grandview School District, they told me that not only do we not keep track of where our employer, employees are on union release time, but we don't know of any other agency in Missouri that does. But then on top of that, they said, oh yeah, all that information is closed uh, for public records requests, so you can't even ask us how much. And several others, Kansas City, same thing. Closed and we don't keep track. But we did find a few that did keep track of union release time. For instance, the Missouri Department of Corrections, they happen to keep track of how much union release time and what these employees are doing. But you know what they said? Oh, it's closed. But then I told them, well, under the Missouri Sunshine Law, all this information should be open because the criteria is that it should, you know, you can get information if the information tells people how government operates and what employees are doing. So once they heard that, they said, okay, we'll tell you how much the union release time is, but it's going to cost you. And they told me it would cost nearly $25,000 to find out what Missouri government workers were doing on the taxpayer's dime. And that's because it was only recorded on handwritten slips. That's, I mean, it's unbelievable. In this day and age, to not electronically record where employees are doing or where they're going and when they're on leave is unheard of. And they said to calculate those handwritten slips, it would take them nearly 2,000 hours. So, Eventually, we did find some Missouri public employers that did keep track of it and accepted our public records request and didn't charge us nearly $25,000. <laughs> what we found that the Parkway School District paid over $25,000 of the union president's salary, who never did any work for the school district, never was in the classroom, for three straight years. So that's $75,000 right there that just going to the union coffers. But even worse than that, they gave union members at Parkway School District a month to engage in partisan political activity to lobby government officials at the Capitol right here to vote no on right to work and paycheck protection laws. But fortunately for Missouri and most states, your constitution prohibits such special interest giveaways, and it's called the gift clause. And there are several provisions in the Constitution that say you can't give away the taxpayer's dollars to private interest and not get in anything in return. 
It pretty much makes sense. You would think that would be common sense, but unfortunately, it's not. But in Arizona, they've successfully used their gift clause to end this practice of union release time. And there's no reason why Missouri can't use the same constitutional provision to end this practice. Or equally, you could pass a bill that says you can't have government workers who don't do the job that they were hired to do, which would be pretty common sense. So that's just kind of why to educate people on this little known special interest for two government unions that is working against right to work, which are trying to enact in Missouri right here. And then I'll say a few words on right to work uh, kind of at a national level and why it's so important for Missouri. The National Labor Relations Board, the federal agency that governs labor policy in the United States, is doing everything they can to force workers into unions. Recently they implemented the ambush election rule that dramatically alters how union elections are run giving workers very little time to educate themselves on unionization. And what that means is unions organize for months and months and months, telling workers you're going to get a big fat raise, you're going to have really lax work rules, there's going to be all sorts of benefits to unionization, which may or may not be true. Normally, it's not. But they don't know that. And it's ushering workers into unions. In addition to that rule, when unions are organizing, They'll now receive all workers' private information, their cell phones, their email addresses, their home addresses, their work schedules, so they can show up at your door, call you incessantly, and email you all the time, and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's why Missouri needs to take a stand and enact right to work. So at least if the federal government's going to push and force unions on workers, at least they shouldn't have to pay for this unwanted representation. And the last thing that I'll comment on, when I was driving here at, I don't know, 6 a.m. this morning from St. Louis, I passed at least three, four billboards talking about, you know, right to work is the right to work for less, you know, all sorts of, and, you know, what was it? I wrote it down. Goodbyewages.com, you know, is what they call right to work. In my organization, we have a couple of copies that I brought right here, did an interstate analysis, analysis of right to work laws. And one of the key findings of the study was that if forced unions in states passed right to work 35 years ago when the first wave of right to work laws passed, Missouri workers would be making on average $3,000 more than they are today. And so anytime someone tells you right to work is the right to work for less, or this, it's special interests that just want to take away worker rights, just tell them that you'd like a bigger paycheck. And rights work is what will give it to you. So that's all. Because the issue is so much surrounded, the other side is so much used fear around an issue that truly really benefits this state. And so because of that fear, many people were, were, were afraid to file the issue and even have the discussion. And so I remember filing the bill for the first time and being and never even getting a hearing that being told by uh, by some that uh, that this would that this was that this was not a good idea, but then but you all came, right? And, and you started contacting other members of the legislature. You started contacting uh, members of leadership, 
and you started asking about this issue, why can't we have a discussion on something so important to our state? And because of that, and not because of me, but because of you, the issue moved forward. And year after year, lawmakers, as we started to be taking votes on these issues, and I'll tell you, the first time I presented this issue to a committee, I, I was a little bit, there was a little bit of fear. In the room. I was telling someone earlier that I don't, I don't know that I slept, that I'm pretty sure I didn't sleep at all the night before. <laughs> but as you discuss these issues, and, and as you really digest the facts, then the fear melts away. And I think that facts confront fear and they will dissolve that fear. And, and we need, and what we've also been able to help this issue is having courageous leaders that have been able to take a bold stand and move, move an issue forward despite all the fear. One of those leaders is, is uh, former Speaker Tim Jones. Tim Jones was, was able to give this bill a, a hearing for the first time and was able to move boldly to get it for the first time to have a vote on the House floor. We've also had a bold leader in Speaker John Deal, who has also been able to move it and be able to get to the House floor, but not only, uh, but now get it to the Senate. And so we need, to, we need to, uh, we appreciate you because without you, without you coming and, and supporting us and all of your encouragement, um, oftentimes these bold, these bold leaders can be left hanging out in the wind. And so I just want you to know how much you mean to me, and I know how much you meant mean to leadership who's taking these bold steps. And, and so I just want to say thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Not aware of that. 